Would you join me now in prayer? Holy, holy, holy God, it is your peace we seek this day. We ask that you would tune our hearts, that we would sing your praise with our lives, with our words, with our choices, with all of who we are. Lord, we love you. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer, our refuge, our savior. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, there was a little chigger and he wasn't any bigger than the point of a very small pin. But the bump that it raises just itches like the blazes. And that's where the rub comes in. Comes in, comes in. That's where the rub comes in. That's the bump that it raises just itches like the blazes. And that's where the rub comes in. If you have ever been bitten by a tiny red mite, commonly known as a chigger, then you probably learned that song as a kid. At least you did if you grew up in the South. That's a song my parents taught me. And I would sing it for you today in full with all the verses, except there are real people here. And we're not allowed to sing in church because of COVID-19. But a chigger bite irritates the skin and gets under it more so than a mosquito bite. And singing that song that I just quoted for you was one way my parents helped me get through all that intense itching that would last for days. We are in a sermon series studying the parables Parables are stories told by Jesus meant to make us itch intensely for days. They are meant to poke and prod and confront and irritate and get under our skin and not leave us alone until they've done transformative work within us. If you've ever heard one of Jesus' parables and thought, that's a nice story, then you weren't listening very closely or perhaps were not willing to be vulnerable enough to engage it. Parables are not nice stories. They are told to provoke us to think and act in new ways in faith, and that's where the rub comes in. The brief parable that Mark read for us today on that pre-recorded video from Matthew 21 seems innocuous at first when we hear it. It does sound like a nice story. There's a vineyard that needs tending. There's a father, and there are two sons told by their father to work in that vineyard. The first one openly, rebelliously, rudely tells his father that he will not go work in the vineyard. The second one, duplicitously, sneakily, slyly, tells his father what he wants to hear and says he will go work in the vineyard. The first one later has a change of heart and goes to work in the vineyard anyway. The second one never follows through on his word. What fun these two must have been to raise. What is it about this parable that is meant to make us itch? Let's unpack it. What is the context in which it's told? The day before Jesus tells this itchy narrative, he had ridden into town on a donkey with a colt while a large crowd cheered for him. Then he entered the temple and unleashed some holy anger on the way it was being run. He drove out the money changers, turned over their tables, and called them robbers. I imagine that did not go over well with the temple authorities. 
That night, he left town, slept somewhere else, got up in the morning, and came right back to the temple again, this time to teach. So tension was escalating between the religious leaders and Jesus, and Jesus was growing in popularity with the crowd, which meant the leaders felt their power and position and authority being questioned. So, in those verses that precede the story we heard today, those religious leaders decide to try to discredit Jesus publicly and ask him a question. By what kind of authority, they ask, are you doing these things? Jesus, in rabbinical form, responds to their question with a question. And he says, if you'll answer my question, then I'll answer yours. And he posits his, did the baptism of John the Baptist come from heaven or was it of human origin? In other words, by what kind of authority did John the Baptist do things? John the Baptist had preached repentance and baptism in preparation for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, and the leaders, before they answer, decide to confer. If they say that John's power was from heaven of God, Jesus may then ask why they didn't believe him. And if they say John's power was of human origin, the crowd would likely rise up. The crowd had believed John was a prophet of God, but he had been beheaded by King Herod. And those religious leaders do not want to incite the crowd. So in political form, they don't answer it directly. They just say, we don't know. And since they did not answer Jesus' question, Jesus does not answer theirs. Instead, he says, what do you think? And tells his itchy parable. And at the end of it, he asks the leaders a follow-up question. Which of those two sons did the will of their father? They say the first, remember? The one who said he would not go work in the vineyard and later had a change of heart and did so anyway. And with that answer, Jesus starts getting under their skin even more. I tell you, he says, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God before you, he says to the religious leaders, because you did not believe John the Baptist, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw what John did, you had no change of heart and did not believe him, but they had a change of heart and did. So where does the rub come in? The chief priests and elders were those whose authority had been passed down from generation to generation. And Jesus challenged their authority. Jesus healed, forgave sins, and taught with authority that came from God, from himself and no human being. He reinterpreted religious law as in the Sermon on the Mount 16 chapters earlier. And with his teaching and life, Jesus had been getting under the skin of the religious leaders for quite some time, redefining their institution, redefining ministry, redefining faith, taking down barriers, including the excluded, and redefining the kingdom of God. All that got him into trouble, good and holy trouble. And it is why they wanted to discredit and trap him publicly. This was their dilemma. If the leaders acknowledge Jesus as having the authority of God, then they would have to go along with what Jesus was teaching, which would mean repenting and losing power and position and privilege. Jesus threatened the way things had been done. And they sought to protect the status quo. And by choosing that example of tax collectors and prostitutes, Jesus makes this parable itch like the blazes. 
that label tax collectors and prostitutes represented to the religious leaders some of the last people they would ever expect to sit beside in the kingdom of God. And now Jesus is saying they will enter it before the religious leaders will. And that's a zinger. And it's meant to get under their skin. Soren Kierkegaard writes that there is a big difference between criticism of a biblical text and radical accountability to it. So we can't stop there. And by criticism, we mean how the ways that we unpack it and interpret its context. So if we, in 2020, hear this parable and unpack it a bit for its original context, how does it now, in 2020, exact radical accountability from us to and make us itch when we hear it. Well, let me ask, with whom do you relate most in the story? Are you like the first son, resisting, rebellious even, to the work of God's mission, but feeling called to it anyway and beginning to follow through? Are you like the second son, Affirming baptismal vows, but not really meaning it. Not allowing yourself to be transformed by Christ because you don't have a plan to join him in his mission of justice and love, perhaps. Or are you more like the religious leaders? Defending the status quo, protecting the establishment, propping it up, wanting to do things you've always done them, pointing fingers at those who were doing things the way you think they should not be doing them, and pointing fingers at people because of their gender or age or sexuality or ability or ethnicity or the way they sound or look, you name it, fill in the blank, needing to repent for judgmentalism, but more concerned about defending the institution than embracing the gospel when you see it in front of you and then wishing you hadn't seen it because it doesn't fit the box that you had set up for it. Hmm. I wonder, or are we more like the tax collectors and prostitutes noticing that Jesus includes and welcomes you? when the religious folks for so long have not. And Jesus says, not only are you welcome, but you get to enter first ahead of them. That you are a loved child of God, but the church sadly has not lived that out for you. And Jesus has come to make it right in the vineyard of the kingdom of God's love. With which character do you connect? Or is there some small part of you that connects with more than one person in Jesus' itchy story? I wrestle with that myself today. Let the rub come in so that Jesus may do his transformative work. We learn in this story that the gospel is not about maintaining the religious institution and propping it up. It's about maintaining the vineyard and helping it to grow. What's our vineyard these days? Our current context for ministry is a hot mess. Perhaps you've noticed many of the ways we've done Ministry and church for decades and longer are not viable right now. We're forced to learn new ways to connect with people when we cannot actually see them or be with them or talk to them in person. And we're working toward carefully, cautiously gathering again in person for worship, but our relaunch team also sees virus numbers climbing, and we begin to wonder if we need to reverse course. Some of us 
cannot wait for life to resume as it was six months ago or 20 years ago. But will that happen? Some things may forever be different or lost or changed and we cannot see around the bend to know and there is so much on my list now of that which I do not want to ever again take for granted. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate, evictions and business losses are on the rise. And how do we make the most of school for our children and try to stay safe at the same time? And needs are multiplying and meeting them is complicated. Many of us are simply tired and need encouragement and are urging one another to be gentle with ourselves and with each other because it is more than tough right now. And the political chaos for which there is not a big enough nor awful enough word will only ramp up as we near November and we know it while leaders play with a virus and lives for political gain. While the sin and evils of systemic racism are front and center in ways we need to be awake enough to pay attention for it is past time to call it what it is, talk about it undefensively and authentically and interrupt it for needed change. That's our vineyard, and it is a messy one. So what do we do? This ground in which the vineyard lies leads us to answer the question Jesus asked about what authority we will trust for living in this hot mess. Americans tend to buckle when we talk about authority, but hear me out. Jesus asked the churchy folks if they believed John the Baptist operated under the authority of God because if they believed that, it meant believing Jesus operated under that same authority for in fact he was the authority. And the next step after believing Jesus is believing in Jesus. And if we believe in Jesus, then that means we listen to him because he is our authority. And Jesus calls us to the vineyard to grow the kingdom of God there, here, right where we are. Because he is our authority, we listen. And he has a lot to teach us about how to work in it, almost all of which pushes the boundaries of the religious establishment. The bulk of Jesus' teaching in this gospel centers on the Sermon on the Mount. And what's that about? Being meek and powerful peacemakers who love their enemies and go the second mile and do not insult others and know how to handle their anger and are faithful and have genuine faith, self-awareness and humility who forgive and are not judgmental and go out of their way to include the excluded and push the boundaries on love and I could go on. That this is what Jesus models and teaches in this gospel. And this is who Jesus calls and by grace enables us to be. This is who we are to be in that vineyard. And Jesus tells us it's time to get to it again and again and again. So will we or will we not? Jesus is already there working the tax collectors and prostitutes are too. And fill in that blank with whomever is the last person you'd expect to find in the vineyard. Those who have been ignored by the church are now in front of us, Jesus says, in this itchy story. It's only the religious folks in this parable who are falling behind and missing it. I don't want to be one of them. If we let this narrative itch like the blazes, Jesus can change it, can change the vineyard. 
and grow it through us if we're willing to be there too. He has garden gloves, it turns out, in your size and mine. Will you put them on and dig in and get to work in this messy vineyard as it is? This vineyard of God's itchy, under the skin, unrelenting love. Amen and amen.